down a little into the specifics uh, and the economic arguments in particular around diversity and, uh, and inclusion. Um, we, I'm going to try, I will probably fail, to just distill out and disentangle various different things that people are talking about when they talk about D&I, diversity and inclusion. Number one, the benefits of non-conformist thinking. That's not necessarily an LGBT thing. The benefits of non-conformist thinking, huge. Number two, the benefits of mixed populations as opposed to non-diverse populations. That's a different thing to non-conformist uh, thinking. Three, the benefits of allowing people to be authentic and not have, to have all the costs and taxes associated with lying about themselves. Four, the benefits of a work environment in which people obey social codes, in which they're polite and respectful to each other, rather than in which they're not. And five, uh, and perhaps most important, uh, the benefits of a meritocratic selection and recruitment process as opposed to one that discriminates on entirely irrelevant grounds. So those are all slightly different things, and we're going to just basically have a lovely panel discussion for 45 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, in which we uh, will disentangle some of the costs and benefits and discuss them. We will also bring you into that discussion, so uh, please prepare your questions. Panel, would you please come up, take your seats, and I will, as they come, introduce them. Claudia Brind-Woody, Vice President and Managing Director for IBM, Global Inter uh, Intellectual Property uh, Licensing. There, Brind uh, Ms. Brind-Woody um, has contributed to books, Out and Equal at Work, From Closet to Corner Office and The Glass Closet, why coming out is good for business. Um, she's also uh, a Stonewall Global Diversity Champion here in the UK. Um, Claudia is close to me. Benny at the other end is Chief Executive of Tesco Bank and Group Strategy Director for Tesco, uh, a member of the Tesco Executive Committee. Uh, his career took him through Standard Life, Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, where he integrated NatWest uh, Retail Banking into RBS. Uh, HBOS and then Tesco, which employs, uh, Tesco Bank employs 4,000 people. And in the middle, Alex Schultz, uh, who leads growth marketing, analytics, and internationalization at Facebook. <coughs> he joined the company in 2007, didn't know the company was going in 2007, uh, and he worked before that at eBay in online marketing. Uh, and Alex has been involved in a lot of Facebook's LGBT product initiatives, uh, including... Uh, adding same-sex marriage and custom gender uh, to Facebook and the, 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 uh, fa the rainbow filter profile tool. So let's hear it uh, for the panel, if we may. Right. I'm going to just slip down here. Um, so we, we thought we'd give you a couple of minutes each just to say a few opening words. We'll just walk down the panel that way. So, Claudia, just a little about IBM and... Uh, what it sees as benefits or costs of diversity and inclusion. Sure. Um, IBM has a long history of <coughs> diversity and inclusion going back into over 100 years ago now. Uh, and we're very proud of not being a Johnny come lately to that. Uh, I have the privilege of being one of the co-chairs of our global LGBT task force and we consider that to be important enough that we have senior vice president sponsors and senior executive ally sponsors uh, in countries all over the world uh, for a task force. So it's, we consider it to be very important to innovation. You've heard uh, that from Vivian and, and probably others in, in Asia Pacific. But uh, as a tech company, innovation is, is part of our DNA. We hold the most patents in the world. And so that's really consistent with, with valuing diversity. Claudia, just which of the various things about diversity, because I, I itemized a few, I don't know, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you would see it, cut the cake in the same way, but is it about non-discrimination, so you basically get the best people, or is it about what you get out of people when you've got them in the workplace and you treat them in a particular kind of way? I mean, they're slightly different things, Yes, I, th I think it's about the productivity and being able to put together high performance teams. Uh, so valuing the differences in thought, but, but also pulling out of everybody their differences so that you, you can recognize them and um, bring them to the table to solve problems. So it, it is creating that high performance team 
environment, the workplace climate that we see as important to us. Okay, just before we move down the panel, um, IBM operates in lots of different countries. Yeah. There are different models for how you operate in countries that are not like San Francisco. And take us through the models and which, I, which model IBM pursues. So yes, there's some recent research on that and, and the three models that they described was first the <coughs> win in Rome model where you just do whatever that country does and, and use that as an excuse not to do anything different. Uh, sort of the middle model was considered to be the embassy model where within the walls of IBM or whatever organization you have, it's a safe space for people to be themselves, even though the culture outside the wall is, is different. Um, and then, then the third was the advocate model, where you are in a culture, you have a set of values, <coughs> and as a corporation or organization, you want to advocate those values to help change the culture. Um, I guess the race to the top that, that Asia was talking about. Um, and so we look at those models wherever we are. Um, I would like to think mostly we're the advocate, uh, but there are places in the world where we're the embassy model, where safety of our employees is the first thing um, and has to be the first right. thing. But within the walls of IBM, we want everybody to be welcome to succeed. Right, but not when in Rome. Not when in no. Rome. Okay. No. Alex, tell us a little about Facebook and benefits and costs of DNI. Yeah, I think um, I mean Facebook's been very vocal about diversity and inclusion, from women's issues to LGBT issues to at the moment um, Black Lives Matter. I think it's uh, it's just incredibly clear that from a recruiting perspective, if you want to get the best talent. You want to recruit from all pools and have everyone feel valued. But also importantly, if you want to import, recruit the best people in the millennial generation, it's really important to that generation that you are a workplace that values diversity, even if they themselves are not from a diverse background. And so to attract the best talent, it is really critical for us to have good employee resource groups and a good <coughs> D&I -like agenda. I also think I agree completely that like our growth team, which has been something I'm incredibly proud to have been part of for eight years, when we started it off, one of our two product managers was a woman. And that's rare, 50%. <coughs> like, two of us, a quarter of the leadership team were gay, including the guy who headed engineering as well as me, on marketing and data. And three of us were born outside the United States. It was an incredibly diverse team, and I think the results speak for themselves about what we've managed to achieve in terms of growing Facebook. And we do represent a lot of people from all over the world inside our growth team. Um, so I think it's both of what you said for us. There is a recruiting element that's absolutely critical, both for people from diverse backgrounds, but also young people who don't have diverse backgrounds but care about this stuff. And people from diverse backgrounds bring a lot to the table because of the struggles they've gone through, and that makes teams better. Um, thanks, Alex. And you've described a kind of a diversity at Facebook. C can I put a slight, slightly challenging question? I mean, is it really diverse? <laughs> So in your team, is there anybody, for example, who is going to vote for Donald Trump? I mean, is that, is that something that is going to... <laughs> do, you have, <laughs> do you have anybody over the age of 65 in that team? Do, so, I, I, I mean, think this is really Because there's yeah. a lot of diversity yeah, yeah. talk, isn't there, that is kind of actually not very diverse. It's about like-minded people getting together. Yes, a bunch of, bunch of gay people on stage talking to a bunch of gay people in the audience, right? That's <laughs> what you're saying. Um, yes, we do have people who will vote for certainly whatever the Republican candidate <laughs> turns out to be. Um, we actually always joke that our head of government relations was uh, chief of staff to Paul Ryan uh, five, six years ago. Um, so we always actually joke about that in the management team, that Republican <laughs> may be the most at risk diversity of Facebook. Um, but we try and actually represent people from all different walks um, of life. I don't think we have anyone over 65, certainly on my team. Um, but we do have people well into middle age, and the median age of Facebook has gone up tremendously since I joined a decade ago. Um, and the diversity of, of age groups, uh, gender, uh, LGBT, open people, uh, black, Hispanic, all of those things have increased during my time there. Um, I think you're completely right, though. There is definitely a, a left-wing bias to any company uh, based yeah. in San Francisco. Benny, costs and benefits, Tesco Bank. 
Um, I, I, I think, first of all, I should say I'd like to talk on behalf of Tesco generally, okay. not just Tesco Bank. I, I mean, there are many businesses represented here today. I would say, having worked in financial services all my life and been part of Tesco for the last uh, eight years, there is no industry more competitive than the grocery business. Customers are very quick to make choices about who's serving them well. And, you know, whilst I am passionate about uh, meritocracy, I'm passionate about fairness, I abhor bigotry and prejudice. I think if we go back to the first principles of running a business, I would say two things. One is, um, the best performance we will ever get from a colleague is if they can be themselves. Um, I mean, w one of my favourite Oscar Wilde quotes is, you know, be yourself because everyone else is already taken. Um, and <laughs> I think it's really important to be yourself and authenticity is as important as anything in life. The second thing is we serve a very diverse group of customers and I think we can serve them best if we embrace the diversity of colleagues that are available to us. So it's very, very important to me. I'm very proud of what we've achieved at Tesco. We have the largest LGBTI network in the UK, one of the largest, if not the largest in Europe, although I haven't been able to prove that. Um, I think we've made progress, but we've got a huge amount of progress yet to make. Just tell me, because this is an interesting one, in terms of non-conformity and the benefits of having, if you like, interesting, colourful people, flamboyant people um, in a workforce. I mean, Tesco supermarket obviously employs a huge number of uniformed staff or people who are dressed in the Tesco outfit in the stores. Do you have rules about what hairstyles they can have, what tattoos they can have on their hands or faces or <laughs> necks? Do you have rules about how they comport themselves? You know, look, all we're all we looking for is colleagues, and all colleagues within Tesco matter as much as any other. Um, and everybody is there to serve customers. There is no other purpose. And all of those customers themselves are diverse. It's important that we embrace diversity. But is it even a dilemma, Benny, that, you know, because obviously customers are going to have a certain expectation, and we know that certain companies do. They basically say, you've hmm. got to... Airlines, I think, have, have done this yeah. in the past. You've got to... You mustn't wear this kind of pendant and you mustn't, you mustn't have your hair yeah. in certain ways and you've got to dress in a certain style. And in a sense, it is the absolute opposite of the kind of hang loose, we want you to be yourself. It's a, yeah. And there are activities where you want, perhaps, you, and maybe a bank is one, where you want people not to be kept too hip, happy, clappy, I'll just do it my own way. You kind of want somebody who's, yeah. who's kind of going to play it by the rules. So I, I just wonder whether that is even a, a dilemma. No, I, I don't see it as a dilemma at all. In fact, you know, having grown up in financial services where actually rules do matter, um, and if uh, th those who haven't abided by rules have got themselves into quite a lot of trouble. So I think rules do matter. I think it's important that you have a, a, the right kind of environment in order to have a, a consistency around how you deliver what you're, you're seeking to deliver for customers. But it's very important that you can be yourself within those rules, and I don't see any dilemma whatsoever. Right. OK, I'm going to come to questions from the floor in a minute. We'll have roving mics and just um, wave your hand and uh, I'll, I'll take a question. Let me just ask each of you, if you just to comment on this, because there, there is an alternative model to the model that Vivian described, that you've all described. There's an alternative workplace model that goes along the lines of you come to work, you don't ask, you don't tell, and your private life, you have it in private or at home, and when you come to work, you don't bring your private life. So it's not that you're discriminated against. It's not that you're hiding anything, but that you, you don't have to kind of share it with your colleagues, your customers, or your suppliers. Claudia, what is, let's call that the don't <coughs> ask, don't tell model of, 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 of workplace environment. Just take us through what, the, what, what is wrong with that. Well, what's wrong with that is that we build trust through connecting with our common humanity. And um, for straight people who say, oh, you know, don't ask, don't tell, just keep it away from the work environment, um, they also are the ones who are saying, oh, I'm going to my son's football game or to my daughter's football game. Um, and, and I don't immediately go and think, how did you get that daughter, right? Um, <laughs> you know, we all bring who we are into the workplace, and um, that's how you build trust. If I'm always hiding what I did on the weekend, which is right. 
you know, for a closeted gay person, the toughest question was, how, how's your weekend? Then, then my team doesn't know me, they don't trust me, and, and it's in those trust relationships that you can be creative, that you can throw out wild ideas or try new things because you begin as a high performance team to work together. So yeah, you're basically saying that there isn't a boundary between private and no. work life because no. you need to bring some social life into the work life in order to have a, a relationship and most work. Do either of you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, we've just got to be a little bit careful. I, I, first of all, I don't think privacy is the preserve of any particular brand of sexual orientation. I think also um, we are entitled to privacy. Um, it's, not, it's not a crime to, to want to protect your privacy. I think there is, of course, you've got to draw a boundary. And I think if you draw that boundary too, too close to yourself, then you will inhibit being the best you can be. But you're entitled to privacy. Yeah, yeah. Do you think you have many closeted members of staff at Facebook, Alex? I mean, you obviously don't know because you, you can't ask them whether they're... That's true. I mean, I think you <coughs> have it uh, in every walk of life. Certainly, there is no one openly gay in our Indian office, although we have a huge number of people who are in the Pride group and have marched in Pride for us in India. <laughs> so I think there are parts of the world yeah. where it's illegal, um, mm -hmm. but people are gay and yeah. they're not openly gay. Mm -hmm. Whether we have the embassy model or the advocacy model, people choose how they want to live their lives and how they want to talk about it. Um, so certainly I think we have closeted uh, LGBT people. I definitely know a bunch of friends who are um, transgender who are not willing to be uh, open about that and want to you know, keep that in a secret group that is only open to the other transgender employees. So I think people should have a right for, to yeah. privacy, um, but we do need, and I really, really believe what you said, we need to bring some of ourselves to work yeah. to build trust and build awesome teams. I think that's... I think that's, that's, that's convincing. OK, let's, um, let's take comments, questions from the floor. You've been listening very obediently, so let's... Um, we've got a question right at the very back there, and is there another one just afterwards? So, <coughs> and then we've got a person over here, and we'll then go to there. OK, so we'll just move across that way. I'm sorry, I can't actually see you very well from here because I've got lights in my... Yeah, tell us who you are as well. Uh, David Pearson from KPMG. I'm the chair of... We need to bring some of ourselves to work yeah. to build trust and build awesome teams. I think that's... I think that's, that's, that's convincing. OK, let's, um, let's take comments, questions from the floor. You've been listening very obediently, so let's... Um, we've got a question right at the very back there, and is there another one just afterwards? So, <coughs> and then we've got a person over here, and we'll then go to there. OK, so we'll just move across that way. I'm sorry, I can't actually see you very well from here because I've got lights in my... Yeah, tell us who you are as well. Uh, David Pearson from KPMG. I'm the chair of our LGBT network. And I wondered, for the people on the panel... Uh, most of your organisations, you've got networks, LGBT networks, and you refer to the employee resource groups. And from your point of view, do you think that it's largely the networks that you rely on to help build um, an environment that, that allows LGBT people and others to be themselves at work? Or is it something that you primarily think your HR team, d &I team... Uh, and the, the corporate machine is responsible for, or is it a sort of blend between the two? And if it's a blend, how do you apportion who you rely on most? Good one, Claudia. Yeah, um, for us, it's everything. Um, we started with a tops-down model where our CEO said diversity is important and assigned senior leaders there. We have the <coughs> grassroots um, diversity network groups um, that are very, very important in country. We also do a lot of training in the middle. Uh, one of the most productive things we've done is reverse mentoring with people in senior leaders or middle management to help them understand the workplace climate. So I, I, think, it's, I think you have to come at it from every aspect of making the workplace climate wherever you are um, open and, and accepting and, and, and genuinely, not, not just lip service, but having people get it with their hearts. And, and part of our reverse mentoring has enabled people to do that. Alex? Yeah, the, the ERG of Facebook's run by our chief product officer who's straight, which is absolutely amazing <laughs> to have him as the executive sponsor of the, of the LGBT group, which gives us the top-down element that's mm -hmm. really important, as well as the bottoms-up element. But we're obviously strong advocates for people using social media at work. And I think the most important thing is... <laughs> Facebook at work, everyone. Please sign up. Um, 
I mean, we're strong advocates for this because we have open conversations inside the company. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, when Prop 8 was going on, talking about do we have like Republican voters mm -hmm. inside the company, we had an open and very, very vocal debate internally about the company's position, about who in the company was affected by like the position that leadership were taking. And I thought it was a wonderful way that the company as a whole was able to come to an opinion that really represents where the company stands today because we were able to have that open discussion internally. And so I think it should be grassroots, it should be top down, but if you can encourage a conversation, a civil conversation internally, you will find that things trend, I think, in a, a very positive direction. Quick one, Benny. Yeah, oh, very briefly. I mean, I think when it comes to big issues in business, in any community, you've got to fight on all fronts. I think the, our LGBTI network is a crucial part of the progress we've made. John Dickinson, who's here, runs it and has done a, a really splendid job. But let there be no doubt there is no substitute for <coughs> leadership taking the, the appropriate position. What proportion of the <coughs> LGBT workforce are in the LGBT network, do you think, Benny? At, at we, we have, we, we, we have 18,000 colleagues in the business who have identified themselves as part of LGBTI. Um, we have 1,500 in the network. <coughs> so lots of progress to be made, but you know, I, I wouldn't doubt. But maybe progress yeah. is you don't have to join the network. Maybe well, progress absolutely. is not having the network, isn't it? I mean, you don't. Yeah. You, Ultimately, yeah. Basically, yeah. if the company, you just know a liberal, tolerant, nice company when you yeah. Yeah, work in it, and you may not feel you have I think anything that, to do. No, that, I think that's right. But it, to be realistic, I think there's a lot to do before we yeah. get to that stage. Okay. Claudia, I, I saw you. Well, no, I, I, I was agreeing, and I think social media <coughs> lets us get beyond the boundaries of, of countries and business units and, and other things, and I think that and our allies, I, I think we cannot underestimate the power of our allies in, in yeah. creating the climate. Mm -hmm. Let's take the next question. We had a, we, we, I I'd actually pointed at someone over there, but I can't actually see who it is. That's it, perfect. And then we've got uh, someone over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Greg Lowe from Willis Towers Watson. Um, this question, I guess, is directed towards Claudia's comments around um, being ha having an embassy approach or being an advocate. And um, while I absolutely agree that um, we need to further the conversation and develop the sort of discussions that we're going on in Asia, um, I'm also aware that there could be the perception if, if you're actually pushing um, to change some cultural norms, that that can be challenging and potentially be seen as sort of imposing your own culture on, on, on someone else's culture. And, and you know, are there, are there instances where that's actually harmful, where, where people react against that and it sets things back? And, and how do we actually, you know, balance uh, those two things out? I think that is a really, really important question. And um, so we'll, I mean, you don't have so much, such a big foreign Workforce in Tesco, at least not anymore. But let's. Uh, well, we do actually. You, you still, you do still. No, I, you do still. I, I, no, Evan, that wasn't meant to be. Evan, as rude Evan, as it sounded. I'm, I'm it surprised you hadn't done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's get a comment from each of you. Claudia, I'm going to put you last on this because okay. you've already given us the, the, the three models so clearly. So um, Alex, then Benny, then Claudia. Yeah, I think um, it's very difficult. I, recently, we faced a lot of challenges in India around our free basics program, um, and a lot of those challenges was about. Um, Essentially, as a British person, I look at that and say, there's an awful lot of questions in a lot of the world that's now part of the Commonwealth about the West trying to impose our values across um, the rest of society outside of, of the United States. So I think it's an incredibly hard line to tre tread. It's an incredibly, incredibly hard line to tread. The important thing to do is do what's right for your employees. Like, first and foremost, I think people who work for us deserve our support, whether they are LGBT, or Christian, or Republican. Um, <laughs> like, it's actually very important yeah. that we provide a supporting environment for those people. Um, and that's where you come to this place of, like, the company globally may advocate, but on a local level may have the embassy model in some countries where it's going to cause more harm than good. And that is a judgment you have to make on a country-by-country -country basis. But fundamentally, I would never uh, agree with the first model, as you said. Like, you have to at least be at that embassy point of where your employees feel safe inside the walls, <coughs> feel valued for who they are, and feel comfortable being open about themselves, no matter which diverse group they're part of. And then, but hang on, you might have other employees who are inside the embassy, who are local people with the local culture, mm -hmm. and who don't respect the embassy rules, or who take a different view of what the rules should be. I mean, you just have to make sure that you 
Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is completely a challenge. Like, there isn't a good answer to this. Okay. You have to deal with it on a case-by-case basis. But I think it's really important that the people from the diverse groups who are most at risk are looked after. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Benny. Yeah, I mean, we we do have a pretty significant presence outside the UK, including India and Malaysia, uh, which are pretty challenging in this particular area. I mean, we have signed up with Stonewall Global Diversity as champions. Uh, we'll, we will work very closely with them, also with Open for Business. I do, I would just reiterate what's been said already. I think philosophically there is quite a big challenge, intellectually challenging thinking about the whole question of passive tolerance and integration. And I think, you know, it, 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 this is not an easy subject and I think we have to work pretty hard at it. Claudia, it's not an easy subject. Well, but I believe that corporations have a responsibility uh, in economic development, and in economic development, um, we also have a responsibility to, to look at um, our own values and to live them. Uh, South Africa and apartheid is an example of corporations making a difference. Um, IBM just hosted w- in India, in Bangalore, in February, uh, 30 companies <coughs> coming together to have a dialogue around the laws and LGBT. Now, we weren't out lobbying government, but our corporate presence together. We literally gave each other courage. We encouraged each other to come and have a dialogue, and now they're gonna be follow on. Xerox has already said we're gonna host the next one. Um, So I think together um, (coughs) we can make a difference in in places where it's hard, And, and I think we have to. Okay, so the next question was second table back in the middle. <coughs> yeah, that's it. You, yeah. So I've got slightly squiffy eyes, so I always look like I'm looking at the person next to you. Go, no, go ahead. Hi, um, it's Sarah Foster from Stonewall. I actually run our global program, so welcome, Benny. Um, my question for you was really that we've seen a lot of progress, particularly in the last 10 years, with networks and established diversity roles, but we're still seeing a lack of representation at the top of organisations. And I wonder what approach your organisations were taking to that and what you saw as the key challenge that's preventing LGBT people getting right to the top. You're talking about board level. Yeah. This is the... Uh, yeah. um, Alex, you probably... Well, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I really appreciate that. Um, so talking one level below board level, management team at companies. I'm, like, one of our co-founders was gay, Chris Hughes. Um, but I'm the first person in my time at Facebook to serve on the management team of Facebook and be openly gay, um, or at any of the LGBT plus uh, community. Um, I think it takes time. I think it really actually boils down to that. Like, 10 years ago when I was at eBay and I came to the States, I was told it would be bad for my professional career to be openly gay. And that's in Silicon Valley. Today, it would be bad for my career to be in the closet. Like, in most of the tech companies, because people like, really understand what you've had to go through, and you're seen as a leader for being openly gay, for doing events like this, for, for like, actually being out there and supporting your colleagues in companies, and you're seen as someone who can also have empathy for other diverse groups. Um, that's a massive change in 10 years. It takes a long time to get people to the <coughs> level where they'll be sitting on the board. Tim Cook only felt comfortable right coming out and talking about this, what, two years ago now? And so I think it's actually more of a matter of time, and we do have to take the time. And everyone in this room who is LGBT and the allies who support them, like, we have to have successful careers, and we have to get to the next level, because we're the ones who are coming through who can fill those board seats. Um, But I think it's not going to be something that changes overnight. Similar to, we've made a lot of progress. You consider the early 90s to today at the FTSE 100, the number of women in board positions. Massive change, right? But it didn't happen overnight. Um, that's, that's my opinion on it. I mean, isn't this... I mean, Lord Brown, John Brown, the BP former chief executive, has spoken about this a lot and written about it, but it, I think it might, it might be it just gets to a sort of a bigger issue, which is the board selection procedures in general tend to be... Um, I don't know, they tend to be antipathetic towards nonconformist thinking, I think. I mean, I think it's quite difficult to be weird and wacky, idiosyncratic, clever... Um, and a bit of a nuisance in meetings, it's quite difficult to get onto a board if you have that characteristic. And um, maybe boards need a few more of those people. It's not just an LGBT thing. It's a, it's a, if it is just a bunch of pale male 
men in suits, it's 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 not going to be it's not going to be great. Can, I'm going to sort of speed us on. We've got a question right at the back there, and then we'll take one more <coughs> after this. We have to rush. Oh, sorry. Just so, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Bissi Alimi, and um, my question just have to deal with the issue of intersectionality. And I think somebody just um, posted something um, on that screen there. I don't know how many people saw that, but. You know, when it comes to the issue of gender, sexuality, and race, how is it easy for companies to be able to manipulate, or to be able to not manipulate, manipulate is not the word, to be able to navigate their ways through in terms of who do you give certain level of um, attention to? And Facebook talks about, you know, the issue of Black Lives Matter, which um, Mark said something about, I think, this week. But I'm just concerned about the issue of intersectionality. When all these things come together, how is it easy for company to make decisions in the interests of the staff and of the company and um, trademark as well? Okay. Claudia, do you want to take this? So, um, you know, I think uh, we, we try to look at diversity um, both globally and locally. So um, a person an, of Asian descent in Asia is not in the minority, right? Um, but women uh, and LGBT and multicultural <laughs> differences are global, pe people with disability, global focus areas for us. Um, where we see that intersection, um, most of us look at the things that are visible. You know, are you a woman? Are you a person of color? Are you uh, have a visible dis disability? And and we j t tend to start there because people who aren't visible, if we we are in the closet, um, unless we have the courage to be out, we can't be counted. So um, I've experienced actually more discrimination as a woman because that's a visible trait. Uh, than, than say as being lesbian um, along my career. So, so I think we, we look at all of that, but the, the point for us is we look at those differences and try to tailor <coughs> leadership opportunities and growth opportunities and training opportunities to deal with the issues that that, that person would have, including our millennials coming up um, we try to tailor our leadership to training for them. So I, I think it's trying to meet the person where he or she is, or whatever pronoun they choose is, and, and try to take their talent and, and make it beneficial to the team. But we have to see you. We have to be able to see all the parts of your diversity in order to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's about seeing people as whole people in the way they want to be seen. and, 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 and you can't splice it up in a sort of very exact way, I suppose. I, I, unless you bursting to come in, I want to just get in another couple of questions. Yeah. Right at the back in the corner there, yeah. Um, Marion Wittibia Naz, and I wanted to pick up from Bissy's point, because while I understand that you can't divvy it up, there are some very hard and fast things that I think we need to acknowledge. <laughs> Being black and gay is an intersectionality that most people won't understand. And one of the things that really troubled me is around, and I, I, I'm looking for advice, it's not a criticism, I'm looking for advice on how we change this. When I look at the movement of LGBT diversity and involvement, we have really strong LGBT networks. What I see is members coming from minority communities, I don't see that in leadership. And I'm, I'm, I want to encourage and challenge and ask the question, where is the LGBT BME leadership? That's my first question, because for me, there is a, a huge flight. I'm not LGBT, but it's observation that I've made over the last couple of years while I've been attending events. And my challenge is this. Once we talk about the LGBT narrative of equality, how comes race falls off the agenda? It can't. I know it's difficult. It is a difficult subject because you're absolutely right. You would appropriate it to the territory you are in. And yet, when we look at the numbers, of BME people, whether LGBT, that are taking leadership roles, there are very few people. And I would like to, and again, it's around engaging the debate, not using threatening words. I think earlier on you talked about using language correctly. You're absolutely right. So this isn't about they're all racist. I'm not.